I would like to welcome you in front of the Kuntal Innsbruck, uh, the all viewers in the space at this live event that is uh, online and in Kuntal. Uh, we are uh, this week uh, hosting uh, Jelena Vesic and the uh, course Solidarity in Time, that is um, a warm up uh, course for the summer school, Kuntal Innsbruck Summer School. My name is Ivana Varianovic, and I'm here director as Jelena was writing. Uh, uh, of this institution and in charge of the program. We are currently inside of the exhibition Free Filmers Mariupol, and parallel to this is running Yelena's course. And this event tonight is part of the public program of Solidarity in Time. I will shortly present Yelena, is a colleague of mine from Belgrade, uh, independent curator uh, coming from the arts history, but also engaging uh, with political theory. Uh, doing uh, projects, publishing projects, research, uh, exhibition analysis, and so on. So I will not talk long because we have a lot of things on the program. Uh, enjoy and uh, thanks for visiting us. Uh, okay, I'm uh, tonight here in uh, double role, being uh, the guest, but also being the host. So uh, first, as a guest, uh, I have to uh, thank to uh, Andreas uh, Oberprantacher, who is uh, uh, who is head of the Institute of uh, Philosophy in Brook, and uh, my colleague Ivana Marjanovic, who is director is here and uh, with whom I have uh, shared history in our youth uh, while uh, struggling in Belgrade and being part of the independent art scene, so struggling with uh, nationalism and uh, uh, coming to this issue that would be uh, also topic uh, tonight and that are topic uh, of this course, uh, coming to deal with the issues of uh, socialism, self-management and uh, non-alignment. Uh, as a critique of uh, the uh, uh, post-Yugoslav uh, or anti-Yugoslav wars of the of the 90s, and Ivana then moved to uh, Austria. So uh, Andres and Ivana uh, invited me to uh, to come here and uh, do uh, lecturing and art program uh, from some of my uh, works, uh, which are a lot about history. And uh, this course, Solidarity in Time, deals with the images uh, uh, of history in contemporary art, focusing uh, uh, to uh, the images of mostly non-aligned movement, but also uh, the idea of the third world, uh, uh, as proposed by B.J. Prashad, uh, and uh, this historical triangulation of the project of the third world uh, becoming through uh, Bandung uh, Conference uh, 55, uh, Belgrade uh, Summit of Online Movement 61, and the uh, Tricontinental Conference uh, Havana 66. And we are dealing a lot with the methodology and contemporary arts in intellectual history and how this is. Uh, all actually connected. So as a, a host, I have uh, this precious opportunity to uh, host the two very, very uh, inspiring uh, uh, cultural uh, workers uh, and uh, also uh, activists in the different historical uh, moments, uh, including this uh, contemporary one. Naimo Hyman, artist uh, uh, and theorist, and uh, uh, Afsan Chaudhary, uh, I hope I uh, uh, rightly pronounced uh, Afsan's uh, surname, uh, who is um, uh, one of the leading researchers of the Bangladesh uh, 1971 genocide and the liberation of our history. And uh, he's uh, teaching, he's, uh, uh, he's uh, also investigative journalist, publishing fantastic uh, texts uh, in uh, different international newspapers and being part of different uh, activist international, uh, international organizations. And we have this uh, also um, uh, interesting situation that today uh, in Innsbruck, uh, Technova. Uh, our two uh, guests uh, are 
joining us from uh, Naim from uh, New York, so sometimes uh, uh, mid of the day, and uh, Afsan, uh, special thanks from uh, Dhaka, Bangladesh. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and it is uh, almost midnight uh, there. Uh, and uh, the uh, video is run from uh, Belgrade, so I thank uh, uh, to uh, Lidi and I also thank to Toby, uh, who are uh, technical help uh, for us tonight. Now we will present Naim Muhaiman's uh, 2014 film of Sun's Long Day, part of the film trilogy The Young Man Was. The series examines how leftist surprisings of the 70s became in their failures, what the artist calls accidental Trojan horse. Archival footage is reappropriated and remixed with the leftist historian of Sans Chaudhary's diaristic account of the 70s. Fear of the Red Horse in the 70s Bangladesh collides with an account of Jean-Paul Sartre's meeting with Andreas Bader in the midst of German autumn. In this project, Mohaimen continues to ask what it means to be an accidental witness to the temptations of modernity, arrayed against dreams of emancipation. After the screening, follows the discussion with Naim, Afsan, and online and offline audience. He lived in a tiny downstairs room of that outfit, and his chief, a fine man, let him live there and be looked after by a foreigner woman who had come to Bangladesh to work as a volunteer. Suleiman had run out of official hospitality a long time back and survived on charity. That night, when I went to bed, the city was being startled by the sounds of fireworks. As I listened, I kept thinking of Suleiman and what this victory celebration would mean to him. And then my own hands began to twitch. I am an ancient diabetic and my ailment has overrun my nervous system. My state of neuropathy had become serious and my hands tremble and jerk quite on their own. That night his dead hands and my decaying nerves and twitching seemed to be bridged. After all these years, we seem to have become one through our failed and failing hands. I was in great despair, and not just because of the state of affairs of this native land, but a million more matters. I knew sleep was impossible that night, as it had been so many times before. I felt we had led almost a parallel and somewhat useless life, and in some strange way, death seemed almost like liberation. And as death became a bright and shining fact, I knew I was looking at my entire life from one end of a journey taken. I was overwhelmed by this sensation, which was beyond control, that I knew I had to write out my life. It had to be explained to me before it was all over. site soon.
I can just tell you, I mean, it's a long road, but I can tell you that um, I first met Afsan Chaudhuri, Afsan Bhai, as I call him, in uh, 1994, when I was uh, embarking on a quite traditional uh, oral history, traditional in terms of like what I ended up doing later, oral history of the war that created Bangladesh, you know, the war against Pakistan that split Pakistan apart and East Pakistan becomes Bangladesh. Uh, you know, the war is our foundational narrative and in a way our reason for being vis-a-vis -vis India, Pakistan, why we exist as a separate country. Um, and I was working on a very traditional year. You know, we are the good people. We are the forever victims um, uh, of a war that's a pretty uncomplicated narrative. And Afsan Bhai just basically met me in 94 and blew up my plans. Um, <laughs> almost like throwing a bomb into the neat stack of papers he had. You know, I thought that I was ready to finish the book, just one more interview. Um, I'm exaggerating. Yeah. And, the, and then the bomb basically like threw up the, everything. And um, he basically shattered all my set ideas um, about our war, our role in it. Um, and very early on introduced me to this idea that uh, victims can also take on the role of oppressors um, very quickly um, as soon as um, independence comes along. And certainly in the Bangladesh context, as soon as we became independent, we immediately found multiple national minorities within our geography that we repeated the same behavior on. Uh, and Afsan Chaudhuri basically, I didn't finish that book because Afsan Chaudhuri challenged me so much. And that began this very... Um, uh, very generative mentorship relationship over the years. Um, you know, Afsan Bhai in the middle uh, went to Canada um, for a uh, lot of years, right? Afsan Bhai, you were there for a decade almost or less? No, five years. Five years. Five years. Okay, so less, less. You were in Canada. For <clears throat> and I remember even in my time in, in that moment thinking that Afsan Bhai was now moving into this role that's familiar to me about other Bangladeshis in his and my generation, which is after a certain point, you go into exile and you take a different kind of role as the intellectual in exile. You become part of the diaspora. And counterintuitively, he left Canada and went back to Bangladesh to start work there again. Uh, and that was tremendously um, uh, informative for me because I was also in some sort of diaspora existence having uh, moved to New York by then. Um, and the specific, this film came about because Afsan Bhai had written an essay called Dhaka in the 1970s, which came out in Himal magazine. And in it was that uh, episode that's towards then, that's entirely in his words, where he talks about almost getting killed wow. because these people are looking for uh, Marxist revolutionaries and they go through his books and they think he's Karl Marx and he almost gets killed until a a superior officer gets a phone call and suddenly there's this sentence the young man was no longer a terrorist and i read this i think about three to four years after 9 11 or maybe earlier maybe two years after uh you know and post 9 11 is this period where there's this discourse of terrorism being retrained onto this new subject and um his essay short but very powerful made it possible for me to make certain connections which is that the post-2001, 
And I say post 2001, but we can constantly say, okay, now we're post 2023. There's always new events happening, but certainly post 2001, there was this moment where there was a pretty universal focus on one set of enemies. And Afsan had written about a different moment in the 1970s where the universal enemy in that point was Marxist revolutionaries all over the world um, with countries in the global South taking support from the West to fight um, what sometimes in Bangladesh was called the red horse. Um, it had other names as well. Um, and he had two sentences in there that he was talking about 1974, 75, but it felt to me that he was talking about my reality of 2001, 2002, 2003 which is the um, the line that says, you know, history has, uh, the state often likes clean shaven men, um, you know, which refers to the beard as a signifier, the beard as a signifier of, I guess, a Marxist revolutionary in the 1970s, and of course, a different signifier after 2001. And then this point when suddenly everything is reversed and the terrorist is no longer a terrorist, is given um, clean slate, which really made me think about, you know, a long trajectory, of at least within the West, you know, the enemy of the enemy is a friend and the equations always keep changing. And there's the famous anecdote of Ronald Reagan receiving uh, the Taliban in the White House at the time that the White House, or at least Reagan himself called the Taliban, uh, the freedom fighters in Afghanistan. That was when they were fighting the Russians. And then, you know, when the Russians are gone, we know that the Taliban's um, targets change. This is very complicated history and I don't want to um, compress it, but. I just felt he was writing from 1974, 75, some ways writing about something that I could understand about now. Um, so in 2003, four, five, I think it first started as a, a lecture performance. It's referred in the credits. Uh, it was first in Munich um, and then eventually became uh, this film because I didn't want to do it as a live event anymore. And Afsan Bhai very kindly um, gave me permission to use his words. Um, Afsan Bhai, have I... Have I done a, what have I left out or what have I elided? No, no, it's fine. No, and I think I, when I saw saw the thing this time, it's, it's, I, I think it's much, much better than even when I saw it last. It's really fantastic. Well, I think I got to mention, put up a Facebook post or something on this. But I think it captures the period, the time very well. So thank you once more. And I remember the metallic test, <laughs> the gun in the mouth. <laughs> this is, that was one of the most stupidest point in my life. <laughs> you're able Thanks. to laugh about it and you're here with us, which is also <laughs> a different kind of witness because I think some of your peers are not around and not here, or maybe not, not able to speak about these moments. I think uh, in many ways, uh, one of the reasons is we probably uh, who, are, who are not being able to speak and that in different times, and I was writing about this even yesterday for a newspaper, history has its own way of choosing the ones it doesn't want to deal with and letting some go. And I think luck also plays a fact. But the most important point is whether it belongs to the individuals who thought they could change history or the large collective of people whom I continue to study even till now who are actually capable of changing history. And I think that dynamics is very important. That Marxists could not change history, but the poor on their own have been able to influence history far more. And Bangladesh is a very good example. So I think, you know, that is something we need to look back, understand. Yeah. I think I can add one more thing which can contextualize it for the audience um, in front of us, which won't know so much about Bangladesh's specific history of the 1970s. Right. You um, were identified at certain points as a Marxist by the state yeah. um, based yeah. on what you did and what you read and what you argued. Um, but you have been very critical of the Marxist and broadly left movements of that time. Um, and actually, you've become more critical of them as time has passed. Um, and part of what I read in what you have written and what we understand is that even though a country like Bangladesh, as with many other countries, had the ideal conditions um, 
for the proletarian revolution, a very large um, agricultural population, agricultural work population, and then a growing um, industrial population, um, which theoretically had the ideal conditions, but the left parties were unable to capture enough of the popular support to mount an uprising. The history of the 1970s in Bangladesh seems to have been uprisings that failed because a certain kind of leadership had the confidence that if we announce it, hundreds of thousands of people will march towards the capital or towards whichever building they've occupied. And that didn't happen. The masses didn't come out. It seemed there was a very large population that didn't even know who these Marxist leaders were and were not interpolated into following them. You've written about this a little bit. Yeah, I think in terms of history, if you look at Marxist history or left history, it's gone through various stages of not being able to do its task, what it sets out for himself. I think in 1963, for example, when Sheikh Mujib went to the Communist Party, the Russian, pro-Russian Communist Party, and said we must try to make Bangladesh an independent state, uh, the Marxist community, the Soviet Communist Party, Koka, right, writes in his book. First, they were shocked that Sheikh Mujib was saying all this. So they, they didn't understand Sheikh Mujib's politics. The secondly, they said, we must ask Moscow's permission, what we want. And Moscow said, no, no, no. We stick to uh, real proper uh, politics. No, we don't want any kind of underground conspiracy. Sheikh Mujib then, with the assistance of Mohsen Chaudhry, goes to India. And the Indians are not very you know, enthusiastic. Or they, they have their own plan, which they probably did. And Sheikh Mujib comes back, and then he uses the street. So that kind of thinking was not there. There was no organization, no structure. And remember that uh, Army League is actually a party which, in its actual form, began much, much earlier. And if you look at the history, if you go back to 200 years of history, you see 1760. Uh, 1760 is when the first resistance to colonialism began. Um, the emergence of these parties began from that time. Now, the divergences and convergences are very important to understand. So there was a continuity, and I have a book on that. The historical continuity is very important. So it was a very strong political party which understood people and what they wanted. And I think the Marxists never understood the villages. The villages are the great movers of history. And the villages have the world of their own. And I don't think, for example, in 1971, when they identified a class enemy and went and killed the feudal, whatever they call them, Jodhars, villages turned against the Ma Maoists and killed them. Because the Jodhars were very important, necessary for survival in 71, because the army ca would come and talk to the Jodhars. So without the Jodhar, who is going to protect them? Who is going to talk to the army? And naturally, Jodhar's family would go then and inform the army that somebody has killed our family member. And then the army would come and take, take it out. So they killed even the leftists. I think throughout, they are very good people, nice people, wonderful people, who probably didn't have enough understanding of history. I think that is a major issue. Okay, uh, I was I was totally uh, uh, fascinated uh, when hearing uh, in the movie about this uh, anecdote um, uh, that uh, uh, Afsan is being recognized in the print of the image of the marks on the covers of uh, some of his uh, books uh, because uh, you know like uh, there is uh, there is a shared content with. Uh, Okay, the same, the similar period uh, in Belgrade, um, which I read from the uh, one of the texts of the famous art historian Boyna Page, uh, who said that during the student protests in Belgrade, 68 protests, uh, the police uh, was reporting these guys, they had the three images uh, hanged on the uh, university walls. One is uh, Lenin, another is Mao, and the third is unidentified hippie. <laughs> unidentified hippie was uh, actually uh, actually Karl Marx. So yeah, 
it is uh, it is uh, totally uh, i mean uh, the, uh, the same uh, in a way but uh, a bit uh, reverse um, reverse story of what you uh, what you experienced uh, okay now we um, can go a little bit towards uh, like um, a more uh, abstract uh, but also concrete and uh, and emotional uh, questions questioning uh, uh, questioning our practice because uh, what I share uh, as experience with Nani is that I also work with my uh, uh, Maoist uh, witnesses uh, <laughs> in a, uh, yeah. a former Yugoslav context and um, also international context. So uh, I wanted to um, maybe discuss with you this. Uh, a uh, question of uh, the uh, historical returns, that is the images of history in contemporary art, uh, the topic uh, which I explore uh, and uh, which is part of uh, this particular art and educational project. Uh, and this is um, a certain obsession with the question of history that uh, I think is characteristic for the left oriented intellectuals uh, and artists of the uh, generation X of uh, our generation, and uh, the um, uh, the terms uh, like return to better past, like past futures, like uh, history for the sake of uh, actualization or Benjamin's uh, actualizing, uh, so history against oblivion, against the, the super now of the social networks, so returning to history against amnesia and, and nostalgia. Um, these uh, have all been the uh, formulations, um, interesting ones uh, elaborated in uh, many of the essays uh, and uh, conferences. So I wonder uh, on the base of this film, but also on the base of uh, your practice in general, how do you personally think about these practices? What's What's your what's your take on it? Uh, now you're muted. Sorry, <laughs> now I'm unmuted. Uh, I was just thinking as you were um, speaking, you used the term um, "return to history" uh, or "return to better past." Uh, you know, even Time Magazine, uh, not exactly a publication that we would consider within our community of friends and allies. Uh, even Time Magazine used this term in um, March 2022 on their cover with a picture of a Russian tank entering Ukraine. Uh, and it said, return to history underneath how Putin shattered Europe's dreams. So this idea that we are constantly going backwards to an earlier epoch and either replaying it or perhaps learning lessons from it is in the zeitgeist, I would say, not just within our um, practice spaces, although I think within a certain kind of um, academic contemporary art discursive space, it came about quite early, but now it's in mainstream magazines as well. This idea of repetition and even the Time Magazine example shows how um, that analogy doesn't work because in all sorts of ways, um, Time magazine thought it was a repetition of a World War II or Cold War scenario, but the events of the last uh, two years have shown that in all sorts of ways it's not because alignments have shifted all the time. Um, I think for me, at least, um, going back, and it's not even to that far back, I go as far back as the 60s, that's kind of my range of um, interest and focus usually the 60s and 70s for me that's sort of the last period where the possibility of um, actual socialism was still kept alive by the lack of um, failure and collapse after 79 you have the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan and then you have the gradual collapse of the Soviet Union and of course the fall of the Berlin Wall by 1989 so up to the 1970s is when it seems like at least a socialist project that I'm interested in um, seems to still be viable. Um, but also within our contemporary period, in some ways, you know, post uh, fall of the Soviet Union, a lot of us, and it might have taken 10 years to settle in or 20 years to settle in, 
were in this situation where there was nothing to point to as your possibility for utopia because uh, Pax Americana, an American and European-led uh, project of free market um, liberalization, you know, proved to be a disaster even in um, the former Soviet Union and most of Eastern Europe where markets were opened up. And of course, most famously, Russia's the example of gangster capitalism uh, taking over. And so looking back at a very recent past um, wasn't necessarily an idea to uh, revive that exactly because you can't. The configuration doesn't exist in the same way. Even what Afsan Bhai was saying earlier about the Marxists not understanding the villages or how to um, appeal to the village population. Today, we have small left parties that now try to do that, but the objective conditions have changed. You know, If you go to a village in Bangladesh, the conditions of organizing uh, that you hope for doesn't exist anymore, where so much of that population is now either overseas working as migrant labor or in a garments factory um, where it's very difficult to unionize. So the conditions aren't the same. So you're not trying to replicate that situation, but you are trying to find, I think, an analog that okay, on the one hand, maybe helps you understand now, as I said, Afsan's experience as a person identified or misidentified as a Marxist underground revolutionary helped me understand uh, the world of Islamophobia and um, racial profiling of immigrants presumed to be Muslim after 2001. He, his writing gave me a lens to understand the now. That's one way. But another is to look back at the recent past to understand when exactly was the fork in the road where things went off track in a very unexpected way. You know, I've already mentioned some of them. You know, the 1979 invasion of Afghanistan by the Soviet Union is a very, very transformative moment, which we don't talk about enough because later on, Afghanistan becomes America's project and we forget perhaps about how, you know, the Soviet for the Soviet Union, it was actually the signal event behind the collapse of the Soviet Union to wage that war for a decade uh, and bankrupt itself. So you look at these things, and these are the forks in the road from a global South point of view, um, the rise of a certain kind of identification with um, Islamic politics as an alternative, uh, more attractive in some ways than um, alliance with socialist politics, all starts in the 70s. And looking back at it becomes a way to um, try to kind of untangle some of those threads. Um, it's not nostalgic for me. I don't know how it is for you, Afsan Bhai. Your project of history is very solidly located in the 1970s and even 1971. Yeah. Uh, I have been, I've been doing it for 45 years now, almost close to 50 years of research work. And a lot of it has been on the villages. And I have my, my basic uh, competence is still, you know, what led to 71. But as I have studied the villages and now I do it professionally, I think uh, the middle class to which you and I, we both belong, we, we really have been outclassed by history. We no longer belong to it. And I'm I was writing an article today that the middle, the one who dreamt uh, revolution, the one who participated in it and all, of they very different from the population in the villages who also some of them participated. I have a novel which is still selling after so many years. It's called Betrayers, Bishar Khatagwa, which is unusual. I mean, that's probably the only novel written on the extreme left in Bangladesh. Um, that novel is still, yeah, where you, you try to find out that the middle class left revolutionaries after 1975 in particular, left the villages and came away to the cities, leaving back the villages behind. So I think the division between the villages and the cities, which I think is a class division, was very, very strong all the time. The revolution, the Marxist revolution was always a middle class, colonial, Tagorean project. Um, it was not a people's project. There's no way we can, we can find evidence to prove that. Now, people started, I think, to, to take over history, and you also mentioned that, the migrant population. If there is a historical force, just like resistance to colonialism happened through peasantry, simply because the peasant is not going to, one of the reasons, he's not going to be a collaborator. He does not qualify to be a collaborator. Only the middle qualifies. And it's the middle who studies, who reads, who thinks, who understands, etc., etc. 
the poor fight and they fought and in 1971 if you look at how states uh, ceased to exist say pakistan in 1971 in east pakistan were not ready for people's resistance they were not they thought 25th march finish everything done everything is nice and today I was being asked how Americans, you know, were involved in that. If you look at the State Department documents, you will see how Americans were involved in that. But the point is the Pakistanis attacked villages and they touched two things. They touched the food and they touched women. And the villagers didn't forgive them. And this is very important to realize that when the villagers fight, they fight for life and death. There is no in between. They are not going to have a discussion with you. They're first going to kill you. And I think that through that process, they gained a resilience we probably don't expect, we probably don't understand. Which is why now, I think Bangladesh, or most countries, not the Western developed countries, and I have been saying this for the last 25 years, there is no such thing as a single state country, us, when it comes to us. We are several states existing together. So we have a very large informal state, and we have a small formal state and the formal state is the constitution the government etc 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 the written state and the unwritten oral state if you will is this very large population and bangladesh has the world's highest proportional number of people working abroad the number is something like 25 million of a total working population of 70 million 25 works abroad they don't depend on the national economy for their survival. And if you take their family member size, which is about five, then it would be 125 million people don't need the Bangladesh economy. And this, I think, is very important to understand. Did you say, send me something? No, I sent it to the group I, that people would understand oh, the reference. Yeah, because okay, you're okay. referencing a lot of things that people don't know. So I just explained it to the okay, group. Okay, sorry, sorry. Yeah. I mean, this is how it goes, you know. Because I was in a two-hour interview by some American documentary filmmaker, and I'd probably put it in. This no, no, but it's interesting because you say 25th March because you are probably used to for the last maybe two okay. hours. Okay, oh, sorry, oh, terribly sorry. 25th March is, is that, that that date doesn't mean anything to this audience. It does a lot to yeah. you. And, yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry about that. No, no, it's okay. 25th March is when Pakistan like, army no. attacked. Yeah, they attacked and killed. So uh, 25th March is is. Not like an iconic thing. It is the day when the Pakistan state were in, was killed by Pakistan itself. They couldn't win. They could not have won. This is the whole point. And I'm a structuralist in terms of history. So, you know, you are going to be able to do it and you're not going to be able to do it. Don't do it because you're probably not going to succeed. And Pakistan would not have succeeded. But this was a lousy, inefficient way. I think I wrote an article that how stupid Pakistan. Pakistan was not killed by cruelty. It was killed by stupidity, thinking they could be able to defend their own country. But this is, I think, how it happens. And this, the same problem comes again and again. Um, I think most importantly is to understand the villagers no longer need the middle class. And this is something we can't come to terms with. So all the stuff that you see on Facebook, all the lamenting, anger, etc., it's limited to a very small number who are outclassed, who are out outplayed. And if you look at one critical moment where the forces of the middle class, the rural middle class, and they're largely the clergy class, funded by the expat workers, they came and confronted the urban middle class, which is the great moment of the urban middle class, Shabak movement, 19, 2014. And the conclusion is clear. The Shabak had to retreat and the Hifazat did not retreat. Ultimately, the state moved in because the state knows it cannot anger the villagers anymore. When the Islamic terrorists uh, were attacking, the government did not make any move till the Holy Artisan Cafe was attacked and the Holy Artisan Cafe had foreigners who were killed. And you are not going to let foreigners be killed. And that's when the state moved. And when the state moved, it took them only three months to end the threat. The Islamic threats existed only for three months. And when I wrote this, I was abused a lot by a lot of people saying, you know, the Islamic terrorist movement exists. It will not exist because it does not have a material base in Bangladesh, just like the left movement. It does not have a material base. And that is why it has it in the Chirong Hill tracks, where they will continue probably to fight and resist, even if they do lose or win. 
the little bit of sprinkling of stuff. You have a remember that your Japanese documentary, the, ja, the Japanese uh, coup. The United about, United Red Army about the hijacking of Japan yeah, airline. Hijacking, yeah. Uh, and you know we call it the Japanese coup because the Japanese mm, people uh, led to the uh, coup with the military of Bangladesh. But the point is, that's exactly that. They're going to be sprinkling. But essentially, history no longer belongs to the village, uh, to the urban middle class. History belongs to the villagers. And I think we have a separate state. They have a separate state. We probably will have to look at the middle, the middle where both transact. And how do I know this? I'm looking at 4,000 pages of data collected over the period of the last one year by about 75 people looking at changes and the changes are all pointing to the emergence of new realities and we need to understand that because it's our livelihood because we now increasingly depend on the villages for our livelihood and the villages don't need us and this is something which is scary you cannot make money as a garments factory owner if the women from the villages don't come and that, I think, are the reality that we sometimes do not take into account. That is all. Thank you, Afsan Bhai. Um, Yelena, maybe uh, we can talk a little bit about the connection between your course and the book that we've just brought out, if that feels appropriate. Uh, yes, yes, yes. I just wanted to, uh, I just wanted to make a short comment uh, on... Um, Please. Son was uh, talking uh, about the middle class because uh, uh, in your in your work and uh, work of many of our allies, uh, as we say, uh, we try to uh, observe the politics also, uh, like the political events as connected, like uh, uh, as connected within this uh, notion of uh, uh, planetarity in a way. So that the events which are taking place in the in the world are not uh, isolated, and in which sense uh, the, uh, the the problem of the middle class uh, in uh, in example um, uh, European context uh, or Euro American context uh, or uh, I mean even including the the context of uh, of the peripheries of Europe. The so-called semi-periphery of Europe, the middle class was even more uh, problematic because it was a, a carrier of this uh, politics of uh, normality, this a politics, basically, uh, the the idea that we should, you know, like just live a normal life, which brought us uh, to the situation of the return of conservatism and return of uh, fascism. Uh, on the uh, political stage and uh, on the governmental level, but also on the level of uh, uh, of the people, because now the poor living uh, on the periphery of Europe are identifying with these right wing ideas and not the left wing ideas, uh, and this is and this is interesting. So I'm handing the mic to uh, to uh, to Clement uh, who. Uh, is in the uh, to who will pose few questions related uh, one related to the book uh, uh, interesting uh, book uh, which uh, uh, is one of these uh, books that uh, um, carries uh, in its uh, title the important uh, word of uh, solidarity uh, which is being uh, in a way uh, uh, overused uh, but also this overuse uh, signifies the need signifies a certain common need uh, of all of us uh, today and we read uh, through some of the text uh, during uh, our uh, course here so uh, there are some questions for you Naim the book is being edited by the way by uh, Naim and uh, uh, my colleague uh, and uh, my colleague Esther, uh, Esther Shakash uh, and published recently, like uh, uh, not even a year ago. Clement. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, first of all, uh, thank you so much, Yelena, 
for this course and for bringing us uh, these two great contemporary men, activists. It's really interesting to read their story and discuss with them. Um, the question I have for Naim is that um, we read as part of Yelena's course, the course is called uh, Solidarity in Time of Non-Alignment Movement and Contemporary Art. So we read <clears throat> your book, Solidarity Must Be Defended. <laughs> Very interesting book, where among other things, you speak about Tehran and the Iranian revolution. That is, you, you question the position of uh, Michel Foucault and other leftist critical intellectuals, who theories we often use, uh, use to speak of, uh, speak of the power techniques. So the question is, uh, did a uh, religion infiltrate the colonial movements? For instance, when we think of Bandung, uh, Nam, 1961, and then the tricontinental in Havana. Yeah, that is uh, question number one. Maybe I'll pose the next question after this one. Thank you so much. Sure, thank you. I also started sharing the um the cover of the book because uh, you have read it or some of you have read it, but Afsan Bhai um, hasn't seen the book yet. So I thought I should just um, share it. Uh, yeah, Solidarity Must Be Defended is a book anthology really, co-edited by myself and Esther Zakax. Um, Esther is now in Amsterdam, but at the time was based in Budapest, um, which is originally from, so it was like a Hungarian Bangladeshi co-production in some ways. Um, the book itself is an anthology, so it's a collection of other people's projects, right? And some of them are, are really famous projects, um, such as the project that's happening in Paris right now around the four Pan-African festivals um, that take place over the 60s and 70s. Um, there's one entry from Bangladesh, which is about Zainul Abedin, who was our national artist, who at the time of this event, he was still a Pakistani. You know, one of the things that Afsan Chaudhary keeps referencing is until 1971, we are still part of Pakistan. So there's West Pakistan and there's East Pakistan. And then in the middle is India, actually. So a geographic impossible entity, but we carried it on for two decades. So at that point, Zainul Abedin is a national painter representing Pakistan. And as a Pakistani painter, he gets invited to Jordan um, to paint uh, the refugee camps there, the, uh, the Palestinian camps. And he does a series of um, paintings that come out in the Bangladeshi newspapers. Uh, then we have um, uh, projects from Yugoslavia, projects from Cuba, from uh, Japan, etc. The projects themselves, and especially the documentation, is from the time. So Zainul Abedin is painting in 1970, and the newspapers are writing about him in 1970. The Japanese photographs are from the time, and the description is captions written in the time. So they all carry the excitement, energy, passion, and hope of that moment. And you can see almost at the end of every sentence, the unspoken or spoken hope that this revolution that I or whoever person is involved in is going to succeed. Uh, it's almost next year or the year after, very soon. There's a sense of inevitability. Um, and around that, of course, is the fact that many of these solidarity movements, um, at least in some cases, if they are battling uh, Western nations, they have support from the Soviet Union and Cuba and Yugoslavia, You know, which is one of the things that we don't have in today's uh, world. Yes, there are other poles of power. There's China and Russia, um, um, et cetera, Saudi Arabia, but they're not the same um, axis of support in terms of solidarity movements that Yugoslavia, Cuba, or the Soviet Union might have been um, in the 1970s. So we, Esther and I had this paradox, which is we're putting together a book, which is a collection of projects, um, you could say frozen in their time. And if they're frozen in their time, they carry all the optimism. Um, and it's all right. It's sufficient to have a project where you just share optimism because God knows there's not so many sources of optimism in our time, which I think goes back to Yelena's earlier question. One of the reasons we keep looking back is we're looking for fragments of hope. But Esther and I, from our political orientation, feel that we don't just want to present fragments of hope without some explanation for why it didn't work out. Um, where I think we are more in kinship with some of what Afsan Chaudhary has written, where you know he 
talks about the mistakes you know he just said you know in um uh, economy of words that uh, the Marxist uh, organizers didn't understand the villages, and in some cases, they left the villages. And so we wanted um, a book that both had positive stories presented in their time, but we wanted to reflect back from our time. And Michel Foucault actually became a way uh, to understand all this because you know about Foucault, it's usually said that he was an anthropologist of Europe. Most of his major works are based on case studies completely in the European context. He didn't spend any time really writing about or even exploring uh, the global South, with the exception of this one major trip he made to Iran, uh, maybe more than one trip in 1978, for which part of the reason was the same way that we today sometimes learn about a crisis in, let's say, Sudan is that we know someone from that geography who is physically where we are, whether it's in Innsbruck or New York or in Dhaka. And usually they're there, what's the first part? Often as a student, um, or they've immigrated and they now live there, and therefore they tell you about their country. And that's how you become maybe hyper knowledgeable about one geography, even though you may not know another, right? And so Foucault, learned about Iran in the same way. There were all these Iranian students in exile in France who hated, of course, the Shah regime because that's the regime that had forced them to leave and be in exile. And from them, he understood Iran as a very immediate struggle. And he went to Iran and he wrote these incredibly enthusiastic pieces about the revolution that was unfolding. Um, and he wrote them with his, of course, beautiful prose and ways of kind of summarizing. But he said this... Um, kind of um, statement that many people said, why didn't Foucault revisit it? Which is that he said that after communism has failed, after capitalism has failed, here's a third force. And that third force is Islamism. And one of the reasons he was so enthusiastic about Islamism is that the version that was displayed there, he saw as somehow it was going to be this spirit, you see this in his writing, uh, that will occupy this space of energizing people. But somehow when it comes to everyday politics of who will run the state, Foucault somehow didn't think that through. He thought somehow a movement led by clerics would be satisfied with a revolution led by somebody else. And the reality of Iran through 1979 um, and afterwards is an immense power struggle in which ultimately the clerical forces win. Um, and one of the first groups, of course, that they arrest and start executing are the left, um, who had joined the revolution. You know, Afsan by this kind of comes back to some of the things we talk about in the Bangladesh context. The left within Iran was powerful, but not powerful enough to lead the movement. So they made a calculated decision that the clerics are leading this movement. We will follow and we will give support because they have this mass power to overthrow the Shah. And then we will figure out who will lead this government later. And then in the later is when things collapse. And why I come back to Foucault is that he was very enthusiastic about um, Iran and he wrote about it, but he wrote about a context that he didn't fully understand. I mean, he read a lot, but he read theoretical material. He didn't read contemporary accounts. Maybe they were not available to him. And then because he dies soon after from AIDS, you know, he becomes a way to understand many things, which is that what happens if you write these dramatic texts and then you never have the chance to revisit it because you die very soon. Um, so he became a way for us to think about what it means to be in solidarity with a context you don't know well, or you don't know enough, maybe there is no enough, but you're also pressured by the situation to make a decision now, because there's a petition to sign today, because the crisis is immediate, and the demands of solidarity are immediate action. Um, we just wanted to slow that process down a little bit. So our introduction and the title um, is where we express that hesitation. So we don't take away from um, the enthusiasms of the moment, but we um, we we express a word of caution. Um, Yelena used the phrase that we have used, which is in messy practice. You know, you have the theory which all makes sense, even, you know, what Afsan Chaudhary was talking about earlier, it made sense that if you have a Marxist movement and you have a massively peasant population, you give the call and they will come. And in messy practice, you find out that you don't have a link with the peasants at all. They don't know who you are. They see you as an urban, out of touch elite that speaks in a language that they don't relate to. Um, we just wanted to at least 
make an argument for slowing down and trying to understand more before jumping into a solidarity practice. And at the same time, we wanted to say that international solidarity is one of the most um, vital tools also in a time when people within one state may not have the possibility to express themselves. So the title is both a reference and a critique to Foucault, but it's also a loving critique because his book is, his collection of essays is called Society Must Be Defended and we call it um, Solidarity Must Be Defended. So it, it's it's a book and a title and an introduction that tries to go in two directions at the same time, um, celebrate solidarity, but also caution about some of the risks of international solidarity in moments of crisis. Thank you, Sir Nath. Uh, if you may allow me also to put ad hoc question here, which goes to the messy practices uh, in cases of solidarity. The question is, <clears throat> uh, uh, Social and political anxieties of our generation. We're talking about the generation of today. Uh, are climate changes, trash, plastic, wars. So, in this way, how is, for instance, material trash with its informational uh, overflow, for instance, conspiracy theories, fake news, and the rest in the same category, are shaping notions of solidarity today? From your point of view, thank you. And this question goes to us, I know. Exactly. <laughs> or naive. Yeah, I mean, yes, maybe. A question for you both, please. Thank yeah, you. maybe Afsan Bhai, if you want to talk a little bit, because you are sitting in a context where information overflow is everywhere. And you are with, um, I'm with young students too, but they're in a different context in the American context. And you're with young students in the Bangladesh context. How are people navigating? the overflow of information in their world? How do they, you know, this wasn't quite in your question, but, you know, one of the things I think about is how does a person not become overwhelmed by this information? Uh, over? I love this phrase, cognitive trash. Yeah, okay. I think if you look at Bangladesh, as when I explain it to my master's level class, which is different from what I'll do with an undergrad class, is... But this is one society, and I'm only talking about Bangladesh, is completely driven by livelihood concerns. And I think this is this cannot be understood by people who are not in a livelihood challenge situation. And for them, information is very needed, necessary, and at the same time, it can cause problems. But so how do they use do they use this conventional social media? Yes, Bangladesh consume enormous amount of social media. Bangladesh had, but 50% of the people use, are able to access social media. 50% still not there. How do they deal with it? They have a great network. And that network is their family network, the village network, and other networks. And they trust that network more than they trust the conventional media information, media network. So when they're dealing with any issue, they will cross-check it, not with another media, but they will cross-check it with their own network. Now, again, going to migration, I was asked by International Organization of Migrants to inform people that if you go, uh, you see that in Europe a lot, and you to, Naim was talking about Libya, that people crossing the oceans, they die, people starve to death, people are, uh, you know, they're fraud a huge percentage of fraud, etc., etc. So when they heard that two and IOM, International Organization of Migrants, were saying, our data says that one out of 100 will die and five out of 100 will suffer and 10% will fail and 30% actually do not make it. And so um, it was explained to the villagers. And this villager said, only one dies? Only two are damaged? Only five are victims? Only 30 fail? Oh my God, we must go. So you see how perception of information is. They are not interested with an information which doesn't relate to their livelihood. Now, I don't know where Europe and all America. I've lived in all over the world. And I think the South's relation to, to information is different from the North's. North looks at information as something to think about. And South looks at every information as an aid 
to livelihood. So this makes information, the processing of information very important. They select the information they need and they select the information of luxury. And this is how they survive. For them, this is not important. For them, they have a very priority scale. This matters, this doesn't matter. This doesn't matter information is huge and they don't care and they do not relate to it. It doesn't affect their behavior. But the real the information that they need is information about how to make money. This is a hyper, if you want to call it greedy, yes. I mean, they will do anything to make a living. So having lived in poverty and having been able to escape from poverty and this being a great way of escaping poverty, they are not thinking about other issues. Now, for example, climate change or so, you know, they're one of the very large victims of climate change is an area called Kulna, where the sea where the sea water has come in and destroyed a lot of fishing. The response to that was to start doing fishing. Sea, sea water, salty water, fishing uh, stuff. And these people are also selling their land and trying to go abroad. So I think processing of information. Climate change. Yes, Bangladesh is one of is one of the worst affected of climate change. Bangladesh is not worrying about the global disaster. I made a video which was shown at the COP, which is actually the big big meeting in 2006. Yeah, it was shown in 2006, and a lot of lot of I in fact the Americans invited me to their country, and they interviewed me in that public video. But the point is that to 50 million to, to 125 million to 150 million people of Bangladesh. It is not something that is on their mind. It is not. So any information about climate change has no resonance. I was recently doing a study on how people are responding to climate change related information. And the climate change information is that if it doesn't affect my livelihood, immediate livelihood, it doesn't matter. What doesn't even affect my immediate livelihood, I don't care. If they, you look at social media, well, social media, does it give me an income? Huge number of people. Bangladesh has more freelancers uh, doing so, uh, social media work than in almost any country in the world, proportion to their population. Number one is India, but India has a much bigger population. Next is Bangladesh. But this country is obsessed with livelihood. And I don't know about other South Africa. They're not working in Africa. I could see the difference. The Africans also wait for someone to change because perhaps because they would with the tribal leaders will take their decisions and all that. Bangladeshis are not waiting for anyone to change their life. They are changing as much as they can. I remember they, when Bangladesh's per capita income went ahead of India. My God, the anxiety the Indians had. I mean, I was being interviewed almost every other day that how can Bangladesh do it? Then I have to explain to them by you have to apply the PPP. Purchasing parity, uh, whatever you call it. You know, and Bangladesh is not as great as India right now, but Bangladesh has definitely gone much ahead. And that is not because of the Bangladesh state or the government. That is something which is coming from society. And that is something which is probably not understood very well in many Western contexts. There is no state. Our state is very dysfunctional, non functional, if you will. Even during Corona, all the research points to the fact that the villagers and the slums were setting up their own network of protection. They were not waiting for anyone. Huh? Economics is a very important issue because the leaders of this were the slum leaders, slum lords, because it's an economic issue. The slum lords have houses to rent. If people die, how are they going to? Important stuff. I can't read the full question. How are they going to survive if slum dwellers die? It is important to keep them alive, which is why this is one of the most fantastic response to Corona came from completely non-medical people, slum dwellers, and they survive. And this is Bangladesh has become the great example of where the Corona infection did not make an inroad. And I've read the World Bank report saying millions are going to die. No, they didn't die. So I think every society and particularly South Asia has got a huge social capital, which is very high. I've been writing about the failure of these banks in Bangladesh. And you can see that in, in Bangladesh, they have these loan groups. These are social loan groups. And thousands have been studied in this study with which I am also involved. 
thousands and thousands and thousands. Not one case of corruption. Can you imagine? When banking in general in Bangladesh is considered the, the most critical uh, sector for corruption. No corruption. So socially, they are much stronger than the state. So the state may go away. But society doesn't go away. And this is very important. And this is, I think, even more it's stronger than India. Because this Indian gentleman was saying, he said, we look at Bangladesh and what comes true is that the people don't wait. People don't wait for something to tell them to do. In Pakistan, my school, Pakistani students were saying this, that in Pakistan, we wait for the state to tell us what to do. In Bangladesh, they don't care. They don't listen to them. And I think this is an important reason. Because it's a peasant society, it is a society which has had to face so much disasters that these are the coping mechanisms that have developed over time. Yeah, yeah uh, uh, so, so society society is also uh, among the things that should be defended today, uh, especially because uh, because uh, the the, the state <laughs> is um, being taken by uh, right right wing uh, power all over the world, and uh, uh, it is also everywhere very 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 corrupted, and it is uh, against the people uh, today. <laughs> So uh, uh, I would say uh, we have uh, one uh, question uh, on chat, and then we slowly close. Uh, though the topics are so interesting that you know, like I'm sure we can uh, talk for ages. The question comes from uh, my uh, colleague. Uh, uh, um, Anna Hoffner, artist who is based uh, in uh, Vienna. Uh, hi, Anna. Hi, hello. Can you hear me like this? Yes. Wonderful. So thanks for the possibility to watch the film. It was really a pleasure. And thanks for this talk. I have two rather complicated questions. But they are really urgent, so I decided I will just I will just go for it. So one is about uh, the Soviet Union, and if you can maybe say more about the role of the Soviet Union, because it was there for me in all the sequences of the film, because Bader and Meinhof were trained, as far as I remember, by the PLO in Palestine, which was heavily funded by the Soviet Union. And as far as I know, Indians, India's intervention into the war was also heavily funded by the Soviet Union. But not just that, I think there is really a formation of major ideology of anti-imperialism, which comes from Soviet centralism, which comes from this understanding of liberation as uh, liberating oppressed people all over the world, but not for the sake of liberation, but for the sake of binding them to a project of the Soviet Union. So this is really something that does not start for me with 79 and the invasion in Afghanistan, but is really, it's already there in Ghana, it's there in Angola, it's like there in so many uh, uh, anti-imperialist interventions of the Soviet Union, which formed the Cold War. So I was wondering why in the film this is not somehow mentioned or carved out more explicitly. And so this is like, because I'm also from former Yugoslavia and, you know, we broke with Stalin 48. So I'm always like, we did not have this. <laughs> Yelena might have repeated this uh, again and again to you. So we broke with Stalin and we're still proud of it. And uh, the other question is uh, the role of feminism, simply to say, in this, because my understanding of um, a transnational uh, non-aligned movement or liberation project or solidarity comes from pessimism, and it comes from really not being um, uh, included by the liberation project. And there is, for instance, in India, there is Vina Mazumdar, and he writes actively how after uh, decolonization, women were not included there, especially the village uh, women did not benefit from any kind of uh, nation state project. So there is kind of this formation of transnational feminism, 
out of a pessimism and out of really a dissatisfaction with all the revolutions. And this is really a network on its own that is formed there that is then that also falls apart. But if you look at that, it has a completely different motivation and it has a completely different uh, legacy because they get involved in institutions, in the UN, in the UNESCO, in like uh, a different setup, which is, um, yeah, I would say also maybe closer to other forms of socialism. So you see my both questions are kind of interrelated, but maybe you can say something about this. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Anna. Very um, complex set of questions. Maybe I can reverse the order. Um, and uh, because I do have a lot to say about the Soviet Union, both in terms of how I understand it within Bangladesh and also why it's not there in this film itself. Um, but maybe to give the first word to Afsan Bhai, um, he has written or uh, compiled a oral history called Nari Rakattur, which is. Um, Women's 1971 or Women in 1971, uh, which specifically takes, um, it's the war narrative too. It's not the left history necessarily, because for me, the left histories that I look at are really post-independence, which is when the left parties start thinking, this is going to be our moment. The war is very much a nationalist movement in all sorts of ways. Um, and within that war, it's of course a very masculinist um, history that's been written down. And Afsan by his book is one of the very important uh, contrarian forces. So maybe Afsan Bhai, could you talk about uh, this idea of women's histories that are first excluded, feminist movements that are excluded, and then how that counter narrative gets created um, in terms of Nari Rakatpur? Go ahead. The, we, we, we do not do it by history of women and history of men, which is what ideologues do. We do history of people. So when you go in an open mind and try to say, okay, what happened? And you realize the biggest and the strongest force of history is women. And not in the way the feminists, Western feminists would understand, but in a way a woman in a village in Bangladesh would understand. So we have, I have a film called uh, Their War. It's about women surviving 71. And it is not about rape because, you know, we have, we are obsessed with rape and the rape of the Pakistan army, but how women are sources of strength. Now, do villagers see this as a revolution? No. Do they see it as a normal activity? Yes. So for them, the activities of a woman in war is not outside uh, their village or family. And therefore, when we narrate them, we do not say, OK, this is what women did. Because a lot of, lot of feminists try to do it. That, oh, three of them picked up guns, and four of them did this, and five of them did that. Not needed, because very few people picked up guns. Society did not win because they picked up guns. Society win because they work together. And if, when you discuss solidarity, it is the solidarity of the villages, it is the solidarity of the families and the solidarity of the households that actually overcomes enemy and triumphs. And in our narratives, it's all clear. Why women are not part of the larger narrative? The reason is that most of the time, people are trying to write a history of firing of guns where you are valorizing the person with the gun. Now you move to a wider context and look at when you valorize society and then you realize that, okay, everyone plays a role and everyone is a strong. And then jumping 50 years, I re last year did an evaluation of a project where they took on some, some, some people called early married girls. That is girls who are as young as 12 or 13 who are married off, right? So these NGOs have been supporting them to learn a livelihood skill. Five years down the road, we find that about 1,000 women who had been helped, about 700 of them have become the head of the household. Now, how did this happen? I mean, this is something which, which uh, all these experts could not explain, except that they had the resources. They were now the economic leaders of the household. So the household is an organic entity which, which is very focused on surviving. So whoever lets that household be uh, survive will be the leader of the household. It is not a man or a woman. It is the leader of the household. 
these are understandings which Western uh, notions of the issues that ideology discuss cannot be understood because you have not, you know, I mean, people who have written about it, they have not explored what is the ideology of a village? What is the ideology of a society like ours? And it's a backward society, old fashioned society, etc., etc. But the behavioral patterns of people, say in war or in surviving poverty and then moving beyond poverty, is similar because they are very focused on making it. Resilience is very important. And for that, women not getting out of this. No, I disagree. Why? Because in Bangladesh, if you look at migration, and I have these data, in fact, I'm scared of the amount of data that's going to come in on women, where they're showing women are becoming increasingly economically active. And they are not interested in freedom. Freedom does not, first there is freedom and then there is economics is not the model here. First, here there is economics, then freedom follows automatically. During the war, for example, there's a village called Shuhakpur, where all the men, male, were killed by the Pakistan army, every male. And these women survived. And I think I, I remember when this woman was saying, I fed, I fed banana plants to my children. So increasing recognition that she could actually survive is probably the most peak moment in my documentary where the woman, they did not, they did not give in. They survived. And I think the story of women can only be told by women. I have freedom fighters, women who fought in the war and they were raped. Now, when uh, they are asked to discuss their role, a lot of people will say, okay, were you raped? Were you raped? Etc. 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 And this woman was very angry and she was saying, I fought. That I was raped is incidental. I fought. So I think a lot of the thing happens is that if you're looking at something ideologically and if you are looking at something non-ideologically and we do not, we think that the villages do not have ideology, but I think increasingly we should be able to understand how is the, what is the ideology of survival. And if you go from survival, then you go to a higher level of survival and then flourishing. It's a new world, and that's why I keep on saying we probably, with our middle class mentality and our education, do not understand the majority of the people. Here, if you look at, and I have done research on that, how women cope with the demands for working. We have the largest percentage of uh, workers, female workers in South Asia, more than any percentage, way out higher. Why? This is the lowest maternal mortality rate. Why? lowest infant mortality rate. Why? Because the leadership is with women in these cases. Now, in Pakistan, it is not so. In India, it is not so. And that is a very big surprise. But here, because, and they have done qualitative studies on this, but in areas where there has been war, women are stronger, and they're coming into economics. And they're, once they have started to come into economics, the questions that People ask, what, are they free, are they liberated, et cetera, et cetera. Pause, because then the women decide. Women decide, are they free or not? Here, I, I remember I was involved with a, in a project where lifting people from extreme poverty. And this extreme poverty disappeared by about 80%, which is an incredible. And it, so Bangladesh exports it to the rest of the world, the model. And most of them were women. And how could they do it? Like when the family, husbands would come back, uh, when they when they had failed economically, um, the husband would run away, and then they would come back. And the donors were very angry. European donors were very angry. Said you mustn't let these these how, uh, abandoning husbands uh, to to mix with the family or allow back to the family. So these people who are running the project, they said we don't care what these are saying. Ask the women. And so they went and asked the women, "Do you want the man back?" And the woman said, "Yes, of course." So the idea was your perception of freedom and their perception of freedom is not the same. And this is, I think, looking at the new woman. And I think Bangladesh women, what they do surviving as garment, regiment garments workers is incredible. I have done a study. I did the study. Two studies for ILO, I think. And if the ILO said, no, we don't want people to know this. We don't want people to know how they survive. But this is a society where 
people have to survive. If you want to survive, then you will have to do these things. So if it means making incredible compromises, making incredible activities, which they would not normally discuss even amongst others, they do it. They won't discuss it with you. They will discuss it among themselves. If they need a husband to show, I have a husband, so give me the rent, then they will hire a husband. Now, this is an extreme situation. But there is a man who has five or six unofficial wives because the girl has to work. So if the girl has to work, she has to stay somewhere. To stay somewhere, she needs a husband so that she can get rental. If she can get rental and she needs a husband, you will have a husband. This is the kind of a dynamics which I think is not very easy for the, as I said, the middle class to understand. The middle class has a fairly set of ideas of how women behave. But women do not behave that way in real life in Bangladesh. That is. Soviet Union, I could explain. The Soviet Union was reluctant to support India even. But the India told them, you don't support, we'll go ahead. And the Soviet Union could not afford it because Soviet Union was fighting uh, the US. So Soviet Union were left with no options in the face of these very strong-willed women called Indira Gandhi who said, you don't come, I don't need you. <laughs> oh, Soviet Union. And they had to do it. They had to come and help. There was no other way. But Soviet Union, I've been to Soviet Union even in the crumbling days. Awful situation. But anyway, that's another matter. Um, Anna, yeah. I can, okay, uh, we're, 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 we're uh, uh, unless uh, Naeem uh, wants to. Yeah, I just wanted to add, I just wanted to add one thing. Maybe I have a slightly different take um, on the Soviet role, and maybe it allows us through Anna's question to come back to the question of solidarity in time. Um, I think there's a very interesting um, uh, about face in who Bangladesh considers its solidarity partners. In 1971, the dynamic is one that will be very familiar to both Yelena and Anna, which is, as Anna already hinted, the Soviet Union would often support liberation movements partially because of who that liberation movement's enemies were. Um, and in this case, because the Bangladesh independence movement was opposed and blocked by the United States because of different real political considerations, including the fact that Pakistan was being used as a conduit for the China talks that uh, Henry Kissinger was organizing, uh, the United States basically decided to support Pakistan in that war, not because of some great love for Pakistan or dislike for Bangladesh, mm -hmm. you know, but more just real politic. And Kissinger was, of course, uh, renowned for this real politics strategy of there are no permanent enemies. And so the Soviet Union is on the other side um, uh, aligned with India. Um, and in 1971, when Bangladesh becomes independent, the Muslim countries, Muslim world, it's an inadequate term, but those countries generally were not in support of Bangladesh becoming independent because what people understood is Pakistan, the Islamic homeland, and the only Islamic homeland at that point built around the idea of religion, um, because geographically the two countries aren't even together, um, was falling apart. So in 1971, there isn't a strong uh, Islamic region role in our war, um, except through silence. If you look at who Indira Gandhi was building the coalition with, it was countries like Yugoslavia and Cuba um, that she depended on to block the United States in uh, the UN, to block US and um, Pakistan both. Bangladesh becomes independent, and then can't get a seat at the UN in 1972 or 73 because China now, not the US interestingly, is vetoing Bangladesh joining the United Nations because of Pakistani support. So you can see these are all moving alliances. There are no permanent enemies. Now it's primarily China that's our enemy, which causes a big problem also for our local Maoists in terms of their alignment with China. And then around 1973, this is the subject of my film, Two Meetings and a Funeral, you know, Bangladesh at a state and an individual level makes the decision after the non-aligned movement meeting in Algeria that the Islamic bloc of countries are a helpful new ally to have. And by 1973, the Islamic fold countries are also ready to, I'll just use the term, forgive and welcome Bangladesh back into its fold. So Bangladesh starts having improved relationships with Saudi Arabia, Libya, um, et cetera, et cetera. Libya is one of the first countries and consequently, which is the subject of two meetings and a funeral, in 1974, we attend the Islamic Organization of Islamic Cooperation meeting in Pakistan, our former enemy. And that causes a realignment because 
Organization of Islamic Cooperation is a meeting that India cannot go to. India is banned from attending uh, by vote of Pakistan because of Kashmir. Um, Yugoslavia obviously can't go to because it's not a Muslim majority country. Um, so there are all sorts of former allies that Bangladesh decides to shed to embrace these new allies. And one of those allies is the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union kind of retreats, even though it's still somewhat active in Bangladesh, but it's not. And in my mind, it's the beginning of a realignment that doesn't serve Bangladesh well, because in 75, uh, the national government, the head and their entire family, everybody's assassinated in a time where if the Soviet Union and India was thought to be able to come to the country's defense, I think that military coup wouldn't have happened. So whatever calculation a secret military coup has before it goes into operation, that calculation included, we don't think these former allies will step in. So, you know, Bangladesh, even within that microscopic laboratory of three to four years, shows that these international alignments are temporary. And, you know, Anna, as you know, as has been discussed, one of the reasons the Soviet Union was ironically very focused on civil rights in the United States is it allowed them to say, look, this country, that's the exemplar of capitalism. They don't even treat their black citizens equally. And famously, the Soviets would sometimes say, we don't have such a race problem, which is, of course, you know, anyone who studies the Soviet Union knows that's simply not true. And it's a, yeah. <laughs> a but it's very convenient because in the U.S. there's footage of people being beaten by police officers in Alabama or wherever, um, and the Soviet Union embraced that. I think those kinds of real politic considerations were always there in the support of various liberation movements. But to flip it, liberation movements were not unaware that these were temporary alliances, you know, including Bangladesh. We were not unaware that these are just, you know, enemies, enemies, or friend. And small countries about to become liberated. It's kind of similar to what Afsan Bhai was saying about situations in Bangladesh where people will use which equation works. Nation states will also use alliances of convenience, you know, may not be permanent. And it, I think it's our job as people writing about it and thinking about it to now look at it with not a cynical, I'm never for a cynical view. Um, I'm never for a pessimistic view and I'm never for losing hope, but with some degree of trying to understand how these alliances get formed so that we can understand future alliances and whether we want to join them, et cetera, et cetera. In a way, what I said about Foucault and how he became interested in Iran is similar. It's important to understand who introduced him to the topic and maybe who didn't prepare him enough for the journey, who did, you know, all of these things matter. We might individually be in situations where we're called to go to a country and attend a conference and meet, you know, five or six NGO groups. And because we don't know the local situation, we don't realize that, you know, maybe one of these NGOs is not what it seems. Again, I'm not for cynicism or pessimism, but I'm, what's the word? I'm for, you know, keeping our minds always awake to the possibilities of these misalignments. Can I add a little bit more on what Naim said? Yes. Uh, okay. So uh, just, just, oh, sorry. Uh, just, just, uh, just the organization uh, plan first. Uh, uh, we have AFSA uh, because of your precious presence now when it's uh, like around two o'clock uh, in your city. And uh, uh, then the last question from uh, Glidi and uh, we wave to each other. We uh, will watch Anna's film tomorrow and perhaps uh, the link that uh, you shared with us, AFSA. As Naeem said, politicians also know all alliances are temporary. Or alliances are, and I've written this word, alliance of convenience. Um, this is how it is going to be, and this is how it was. So there are no good guys, there are no bad guys. Naim is a positivist, positive person. I'm not positive or negative. <laughs> I, I just, I'm a structuralist, okay. No positive friendship. Personal friendship, yes. But statewide friendship, no. It doesn't exist, and that's how it is. So that's all. Okay then. Bleeding. I remove myself from the from the recording. So do you hear me, right? Um, two, two brief questions. Uh, one for Afsan. Uh, Afsan, you mentioned the the importance of historical continuity in the 1970s. How do you see this matter of continuity in 2024 from this perspective? Okay. 
since, uh, as I have explained, I hope that there is no one single uh, society <coughs> in Bangladesh. Bangladesh, I'm sticking to Bangladesh, and there is the formal uh, part of the state, and there is the informal part of the state. And I say continuity in both. The formal part of the state would be the government's agency, the army, the bureaucracy, etc. And they have continued. They have prospered and flourished, but they have not been able to gain the confidence they need to, as a state, move up. So therefore, I would say that problem that they had in the 70s continues now. And this is how it is when you are fighting for a state. They were very good at fighting for the state. They were not very great at constructing the state. And so the formal sector remains very weak. And the formal sector is not formal enough. So in a state like ours, which is generally informal, it is very difficult to build formality. And they have not been able to build that kind of formality. So you do not have great elections. You do not have great participation. You do not have great law and order. You have massive corruption. All the problem that ails the formal part of the state. The informal part of the state, if you go in, is also in continuity. Because the informal part of the state, even during the colonial era, were fighting the state. They continued fighting in 1971. They were not ideological fighters. They were people who fought because they wanted either to take revenge or they thought we have to kill them because they will either kill us. So it is a kind of a much more of a visceral, intuitive response to a crisis and a danger. And that is what they did. Now, where is the continuity? The continuity, they were ignored by the formal part of the state. And it didn't matter to them. They were not expecting anything from the formal state. They have continued. And today, their condition in the entire history is at its, at its peak. I'm not saying they don't have many more peaks. I think they have many more peaks. The reason is they do not wait for the government to do anything for them. This is very important. And I... I think, you know, anywhere you go, everyone is will criticize the government. But you ask a peasant, and the peasant does not criticize the government. He doesn't know the government. He doesn't have a government. So he is kind of, I'm on my own. My government is probably my village. I will listen to them. I will do whatever is required of me. And I will do what is best for my family. So this kind of equation is very strong now. Social media has come in, and people put a lot of effort saying social media is bringing us together. No, social media is also driving us apart. The percentage of people who are interested in the state remains limited to 15, 20, 25%. The 75% of the people are not interested in the state. So you can understand how we have ignored the informal social forces and focused only on the formal social forces of the state. We have ignored society and its functioning. And I think that applies to Bangladesh as well. Gridi, you had a second question? Um, oh, yeah, I, I thought uh, uh, we are running late. It's directed to we you. We are running very much uh, late. Yeah, uh, yeah, a brief question is uh, where and how you reach for archives, how you work with them, how much you trust them? Mm, trust. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, it's a, it's a really long conversation, maybe for a separate session. I will not try for an overarching answer, but just um, share a few uh, brief anecdotes. Uh, my own engagement with the archive has been marked by absence, uh, by almost always not finding what I'm looking for. Uh, at the beginning, I thought it was because I'm just not good at this. And over two decades, I started feeling it could also be because some of these things I've heard about uh, don't exist. Uh, in some cases, I really think they don't exist, even though it's like a rainbow um, at the end for researchers. And when you don't have much, then those small fragments that you have are everything, and it actually makes you more creative. Um, there's an anthropologist, Delwar Hossein, who um, wrote this uh, wonderful book called Boundaries Undermined, uh, which is about the India-Bangladesh border and about how this town, which is a coal town, where things get coal gets shipped between India and Bangladesh and many other things, it's basically there isn't a border. It's like a place where the two countries meet and have their own kind of relate to what Afsan Chodhi was saying, informal economy. Um, and he wrote this whole book. He spent all this time doing very traditional ethnographic research. And on the last day, he writes about this in his book, on the last day of his trip, he realized 
that the building he was staying in next door to it was a room with all these um, records of the company that used to be there. And in the six months or so that he had been there, he had never looked into that room because he was so focused on interviewing people. And on this day, he realized they've cleaned it out, probably to actually sell all that paper as pulp. And there are only a few fragments lying around on the floor. And in the book, he talks about picking up those fragments and finding out that they're records of how much people have worked, how much they earned from 10, 15 years ago. Very valuable. And so the book is a little bit of that part is a lament. Oh, if only I had arrived earlier, I only have these fragments. Let me tell you about these fragments. And I remember reading that and thinking that if he had found the entire storeroom, um, I think he would be so overwhelmed by the volume of material that he wouldn't know how to write about it. So sometimes just having fragments is um, can be helpful because you have what's what's the limited or disappearing archive and you have to be more inventive and write based on only having found fragments. But it also means you can not only finish the work, but also maybe have avenues for more creative blending of fiction and nonfiction, um, which is not necessarily an academically acceptable practice, but can be a practice within um, contemporary art and um, film as well, film that doesn't um, claim to be documentary. So that's been my space of opening. And I'll say one other thing about the archive now coming to the current moment. So I'm teaching a class on artificial intelligence right now, something that I'm very, very, very skeptical about, and that's why I'm teaching it. And we did this exercise in class uh, where we basically used artificial intelligence to invent an image of Salvador Allende on September 11, 1973 in the streets of Chile. For those who know the history, September 11, 1973 is the day he's killed um, in the coup. So it's the in two meetings and a funeral, I call it the other 9-11. Um, and Melchin has a wonderful film called 9-11 slash 9-11 that puts the two 9-11s in conversation, Chile and New York. Um, you know, the AI generates a beautiful image. It has that very glossy surface that looks like a video game, which instantly tells you that it's AI and not a real photograph. Things are a little too crisp. But the AI doesn't have a conscience or a certain kind of political memory because if you know the significance of that date, you know that that's the day that Salvador Allende is surrounded by the army and killed. And this photograph is a this image that AI creates is a very happy image. Um, you know, he's sauntering down the streets of Santiago. Like the AI generated cars that look like they're actually from a database of cars in Havana in like the 19th Gl um, Glorious Allende. Sorry? Glorious image of Allende. Glorious and uh, 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 the AI doesn't know what is the significance of that date or yeah, why sure. somebody would want to ask about Allende in 1973 in Chile. Um, so it produces a catalog like image. And in the class, one of the things we're talking about is we're still early. What happens in 10 years time when there are, I don't even know what the word is. It's not millions. It's like billions of images are generated like this because it will be right because there's a commercial imperative now you know the the what do you do about the archive when there's this parallel archive being generated by artificial intelligence that has no author and that has no way of tracing back to the provenance we were sitting there trying to figure out how many images were collapsed together to create this one image um and then we kind of went into paralysis after a while because what do you do with this image and that's the other side of the archive that now I worry about, we used to be in this space where fragments of documents were precious and rare and limited. And the number of people working on this was limited. So in a way you knew that whoever was pursuing this quixotic quest was probably actually really interested in tracing down the story to its back end. That's now paralleling this other space where maybe soon you'll have an abundance of an archive, but it'll be an incredibly unreliable archive. Um, and I don't have a resolved way to think about it. I'm just hmm. thinking about maybe the alarm in my voice is already coming across because <laughs> yeah. nothing's, more dis nothing's more discombobulating than starting to teach your students something. And they're all 21, 22. So they're, you know, I always ask about 9-11. And now I'm at a point where if I ask about 9-11, meaning the American one, 2001, these kids are all born after that. So you're already within that post history in terms of what was a changing moment for us didn't exist for them. Um, and I have this, I wonder about now teaching and bringing to their attention these elements that 
fundamentally are going to create a crisis of imagery of, I mean, it's too much to say crisis of truth because that's already there. But for archival practices, it's going to create an earthquake that I don't know where it will end up. Yeah, it's a huge story, but uh, I guess for another occasion, yeah. Yeah, archival, uh, archival uh, fever uh, 3.0 or something. Okay, thanks uh, everyone in this space. Uh, those of you who left uh, until the end, uh, thanks to those of you who stayed online until the end. Uh, thanks uh, to our guests, to people who posed the question. Thanks, Ivana. Thanks, Toby. Thanks, Lidi. Thanks to the student group. And uh, okay, hope to see you uh, soon. Uh, yeah, I think. Uh, this is just the beginning of uh, discussion. Thanks, Afsan, especially for. Thank you. Okay. Us. We'll invite you in uh, another event in Belgrade as well. <laughs> okay. <laughs> on, Zoom or in per on Zoom or in person? Uh, we'll see. We'll see. It depends on. You get Afsan how... onto a plane. You can't just be in your bedroom, Afsan Bai. We have to get you out of there. <laughs> we can do both. <laughs> okay, <laughs> take care. Bye bye. Same time zone. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.